Hi, I'm Rob Langton from Development Ready. Our interview series delves into the lives of Australia's most respected property thought leaders and decision makers and uncovers what makes them tick. This is the interview. Our next guest is Bray Sokolsky, Founder and Chief Investment Officer of MaxCap Group. Bray, thanks for your time this afternoon. As I understand it, you launched MaxCap Group around March 2007. Tell us a little bit about your background and the background of the business, I suppose. My background's quite diverse and I certainly uh, don't have finance and property running through my veins. I actually um, studied law at university and then went into sort of a um, commercial role at uh, FMCG business, uh, Cabbage Schweppes, and um, thought I wanted to stay in sort of a marketing sales role within that industry, um, but was gonna use it more as a, um, I guess a learning ground for me to pick up what's important in business, learn from people's virtues and vices and go out and do something on my own fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I sort of had a three to five year plan uh, to start a business in my late 20s, always fairly entrepreneurial. Um, and as things would have it, my business partner, Wayne Lasky, who um, I've known since we were in primary school, and we'd always said we were gonna go into business together at some stage um, during the course of school. Um, he was at Visi Industries, also very lateral to what we're doing now. Um, and we actually uh, started a business which had first right of refusal on RMIT technology um, through a mutual connection um, and we were able to commercialise some technology coming out of RMIT basically at our discretion, um, which was fantastic because we saw so much diversity and so many different opportunities and it's venture capital effectively. So, you know, we, we launched probably half a dozen um, different um, products um, and five of them failed, but one of them was very successful, which is a solar energy, um, advanced solar energy technology um, that got sold uh, into China. Um, and that sort of reached the end of its uh, lifespan, that, um, that uh, um, relationship with RMIT. And we're looking for something new. And Wayne's father actually is in property and he had dealt with um, two guys who had previously run a very similar business business model to MaxCat and they'd sold the business and wanted to start again. And Wayne and I were looking for something to do and something a bit media to bite off, something more sort of a, a long-term horizon and thought, you know what, this is a great opportunity. We're going to learn the ropes from these experienced guys. Mm -hmm. And hence, we were thrust into the world of real estate finance without any experience just Amazing. before the GFC. Amazing. Yeah, so very serendipitous how that all came about. And have you seen the business evolve over the past 13 years? As I said, you launched it in March 2007, so prior to the GFC. How has it evolved and grown over that 13 or so years? Oh. The landscape of uh, commercial real estate debt has changed so dramatically in that time. You know, Pre-GFC, the banks you know, were a pure oligopoly when it came to a commercial real estate debt and they were lending developers up to 100% of development costs. Borrowers have moved from one bank to another on the back of 10 basis points. Um, it was an incredibly aggressive environment um, with the major banks. And there was basically no room for um, other players. Even mezzanine finance, because banks were so aggressive with their gearing, mezzanine finance was really the dominion of second tier lenders, um, lenders that wanted to deal with borrowers that weren't necessarily credit worthy. It wasn't seen really as a legitimate asset class uh, pre-GFC. So to be honest, our model as we started was in a, in a market where it was relatively defunct what we're offering. Um, so we acted more as an advisor to some major property players in terms of sourcing the best um, bank finance. Then with the GFC, there was a massive market dislocation. The oligopoly remained in place, but all of a sudden the banks had to leverage down. So rather than offering 100% of costs, they were offering 75 to 80% of costs. And that's when mezzanine finance really started to mature and develop into a legitimate asset class in Australia and MaxCap started to be active in that space yeah. um, and source institutional capital and develop uh, you know, different types of strategies to participate alongside the banks and grew our mezzanine finance book to be the largest um, in Australia on the back of that institutional capital. Um, 
So that was sort of the second wave of, of dramatic uh, change um, within that 13 year period. Then came 2015, 16, when APRA, the regulator, all of a sudden decided to put its foot on the bank's neck and that they were overweight in real estate and forced the banks basically to retreat from real estate lending and open up this whole new opportunity for non-bank lenders to participate um, and actively fund credit worthy, strong developers. Rather than being sort of another layer of finance behind the banks, all of a sudden you could be at the forefront competing against the banks. Yeah. Once again, I think we were fairly um, prescient in seeing that opportunity ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And we had lined up some very large institutional capital to participate as a, as, you know, in first mortgage lending. So we hit the ground running when that next wave of dislocation happened um, and were able to capitalise on that opportunity and be at the forefront of that non-bank lending space. And from that point till now, it's obviously continued to grow as the banks have continued to retreat. Yeah. Um, and we've seen a much more mature and diverse and dynamic commercial real estate debt market yeah. now vis-a-vis -vis where we were in 2007. So in terms of the alternative lending space at the moment, how, how has it changed in terms of the competitiveness and how do you stay at the forefront of, of being one of the competitive lenders in the marketplace? Yeah, it's a very good question. The non-bank lending space was you know, effectively non-existent a decade ago. Uh, so um, when this you know, major dislocation happened in, in 2015, 2016, there was this tectonic shift from banks to non-banks. All of a sudden, you know, there was this universal acknowledgement of you know, this major opportunity. Um, so there were some established players that have been doing it for quite some time, like ourselves and, um, and a number of others. But then all of a sudden, there was this influx of competition, both from domestic and global institutions. Um, and the competitive advantage we had is we'd already had an established brand name and we had very strong relationships with borrowers through the advisory you know, function that we sort of started um, and grew the business through to the mezzanine finance that we're providing these top tier developers. So we had established our credentials and the relationships and relationships really is still what holds us um, in exceptionally good stead in the marketplace. You know, the ability to um, fall back on your track record, the um, referrals you get by virtue of, you know, delivering on commitments to borrowers. Um, and to have that confidence and certainty of, of funding, knowing when you issue a term sheet, you're gonna be there to fund and having that sustained um, track record of success in doing so, that's very difficult and there's a very high barrier of entry. Even if you've got big global capital and coming in beating your chest, mm. without having that background entrenched um, understanding of the Australian market and those relationships, it is difficult to still penetrate. Mm. Um, and whilst we have very competitive capital and you know very um, adroit with structuring finance, mm. that stuff's all secondary to relationships. Yeah. And meeting commitments and people being able to rely on you. Um, and like I said, that's what creates high barriers to entry in any financial services business and continues to set, set us apart from the competition. And you mentioned relationships there. Have you gone about building relationships with your key clients and, and some of those really prominent developers, whether they're in Melbourne, whether they're in Brisbane, yeah. Sydney, Perth? How do you go about building a, a relationship with some of those guys? Yeah, I mean, relationship building is one of those intangible things, Rob. Um, you know, like I'll maintain business development, the ability to open door and close door. Mm -hmm. That's still the single most valuable commodity anyone can bring to a business across industries. Um, so there is no science behind relationships. It's about empathy, it's about emotional intelligence, um, it's about integrity, um, it's about um, people enjoying your company, genuinely enjoying doing business with you. Um, because whilst, yes, you have to look at things through a commercial lens, if you actually like someone and they're offering exactly the same thing as someone who you don't like, you're going to gravitate to that person where you have the natural um, affinity with. Mm. Um, so, you know, for me, that's the, the, I think that's the highest skill I have and go and learn that at university. You know, my law degree means absolutely nothing when I'm, you know, at a lunch whining and dining a client and trying to convince him to do business with MaxCat. Yeah. 
Mm. Your intellect's irrelevant, your academia is irrelevant. It just comes down to the connection. Um, so that's, I guess, the best answer I can give. And I've tried to in, inculcate that um, within the business. Um, and, you know, at, at its essence, it's actually just being a good person mm. and doing the right thing. Yeah. Um, and if you promise something, make sure you deliver on it. Mm. Um, people don't forget that. And what about the regulatory environment at the moment with APRA and FERB and, and all these different organisations and, and government bodies? How do you go about navigating that, that environment and do you expect more or less regulation over the coming years? Yeah, well, we are, we're in a privileged position where we aren't regulated by APRA as a non-bank lender. Mm. Uh, so we have an AFSL, so it's an ASIC regulation, but APRA have no um, regulatory power over commercial real estate lenders that aren't ADIs, Australian Deposit Taking Institutions. The reason why I feel we're future-proofed in that regard is we're not a balance sheet lender like the banks. So we are an investment manager, which effectively means whilst we will co-invest alongside our um, private or institutional capital, we're effectively representing that capital and investing on their behalf. So if, you know, God um, uh, hope that doesn't happen, but if something happens to MaxCap and the business collapsed, mm. the structure is such that we're an investment manager, you just bring in a different trustee effectively to manage that mortgage and the, the capital still stays on foot, yeah. still li liquid, and you're funding your commitments. Mm -hmm. Whereas if a bank collapses, it's balance sheet and you can no longer fund your commitments. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference. And that's why they have these capital ratios and all this um, rigorous uh, um, safeguards around protecting and preserving their businesses because they we can't afford them to collapse a because they're so large but also b because of the fact that they're actually directly lending the money not mm. acting as an investment manager so i don't think we'll ever really um uh be the sinecure of, of all sort of regulatory eyes be by virtue of that mm. you know i do believe that in time the regulatory regime will probably encompass non-bank lenders more around the um credit um, standards mm -hmm. than the um, balance sheet uh, um, preservation. We've already put that in place and have very rigorous processes, so that doesn't hold any fear for us. Just on that, I was going to ask you, where, where does the capital originate from? I mean, obviously, it would be high net worth individuals, family offices, but where else do you, do you really get that capital input into the business? Yeah. Good question. So there's really three key buckets of capital for us. One is the uh, mandates we have with the superannuation funds, mm -hmm. um, which effectively criteria against which we can invest their money. Um, we go do the origination, do our own internal credit, and then it gets signed off by the super funds, but we have exclusive right to access their money to invest. Mm -hmm. and that's typically for very, very large scale transactions. Then we have another bucket of capital, which is discretionary funds which we raise capital from smaller institutions and privates, and it's a pooled fund effectively, once again, against criteria, mm -hmm. and we manage that money on their behalf and manage a pool of loans in that fund, and that typically has a closed end, so it might be a four or five year fund, might have 10, 15 loans uh, that we manage on their behalf, and then we distribute income accordingly and then close the fund and return the capital on conclusion mm. and then the third and final one is what we call syndicated loans where for one reason or another it doesn't meet the parameters of the mandates or the discretionary funds mm -hmm. and a lot of transactions um, fit within this mold and we'll go and effectively raise the money on a deal by deal basis issue an IM each investor signs off um, on their commitment um, against the um, investment memorandum um, and then we'll bring together, could be anything between two or three investors, up to 20 investors into one loan, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then go on to the next one and raise the capital again. Mm -hmm. So they're the three ways that we effectively operate in the market. And what about the equity side of the business? I think I read or saw recently that you're starting to invest in projects yourselves and, and develop projects potentially yourselves. Tell exactly. us a little bit about that. Well, that's a, ver that's a burgeoning um, uh, 
um, business unit for us uh, and a real uh, growth um, engine for the business moving forward. We'll never be a developer, it's important I um, qualify that role. We don't want to be a developer, um, we don't profess to be, uh, we certainly don't want to be competing against our clients, but what we are is a capital partner. So where a developer client needs a joint venture partner, doesn't want to fund the equity in its entirety or doesn't have the capacity to fund the equity in its entirety for a development, we'll look at the project and look to be effectively in a first loss position alongside that developer as a joint venture partner. Mm -hmm. And it's important that we separate that business from our debt business because A, conflicts, um, and they can arise if you're doing both debt and equity. Um, but more importantly, it's a different skill set. Yes, you need to understand real estate in both functions of the business, but looking at transactions from a direct investment perspective and a first loss position as opposed to looking at investments from a debt perspective, very different dynamic. So we have resources that are much more experienced in asset ownership and acquisition in our direct investment rather than financing in our, in our debt business. Um, the beauty of the direct investment business is you're able to control your destiny more effectively that in the investment business because in the debt business you're relying on the activity of your clients on developers actually buying sites developing out whereas in the direct investment business it's easy to approach clients be more proactive about supporting them to get developments off the ground um, so we've seen particularly through COVID um, it's been a, a, a very active and successful component of our business. Just in terms of, uh, of sectors that you're targeting at the moment or sectors that you're avoiding, I mean, you know, you deal with uh, a, a breadth of developers, as I mentioned in the opening, right across the East Coast and, and even in New Zealand now as well. So there must be some sectors that you're really seeing growth opportunities in and others that you're trying to reduce risk and exposure in. Tell us about that. I mean, they're sort of self-evident at the moment, you know, the sectors that are difficult um, and uh, have uncertainty associated with them, particularly hospitality and hotels um, and commercial office, where we're, we're not bearish about the prospects of those asset classes longer term, but in the immediate term, we definitely are reserved by virtue of there just being a lot of the high degree of uncertainty as to when those asset classes are going to recover. Um, so. We're certainly not actively pursuing um, exposure um, in hotel and, and office. Um, we're very bullish around industrial. Um, the whole COVID experience has only reinforced how critical e-commerce is um, to, the, um, to the ecosystem of the economy. Um, that whole last mile thesis um, resonates really strongly with us. And we're very, very active in that space from both the direct investment and the debt perspective. We're still very um, buoyant about residential. Um, I feel like there's going to, by virtue of, of COVID, uh, supply um, is going to fall off a cliff in two or three years because no projects are being activated. And there's the housing crisis that we had, you know, that precipitated the, um, uh, you know, the large uh, glut of supply, I guess, uh, from 2015 to 2019 still hasn't been rectified. Um, we're still not in an equitable um, environment with regards to supply, demand and supply for housing. Um, so we feel that if you can activate project and just get it moving, you know, the story on completion is going to be very positive come 2023. It is difficult to sell off the plan. Hence, um, this um, huge movement towards multifamily and, and build to rent because you don't have the same challenges of having to sell off the plan um, when there's very little incentive for buyers. Um, you can get the product built and then hold it and you know prospectively have a very good yield on completion. Um, but yeah we are we are still very active and very keen to support residential development. It's perfect timing, actually, that you mentioned build to rent there. What's your assessment of it? Are you bullish? It sounds like you're relatively bullish on its growth here in Australia. And I suppose the second part of that is, are you seeing many of your developer clients take a close look at it or actually take the plunge and, and start to build those sort of build to rent projects? Yeah, um, I think it's overhyped. Uh, you know, every developer is looking at build to, to rent. There's no doubt it's, it's the flavour of 2020. Um, there's definitely a place for it, but I do still believe it's 
a niche asset class um, and will remain so for some time. The problem with built to rent in Australia is it doesn't have the tax, um, uh, we don't have the tax structure in Australia to support it. Um, so it's very difficult for a built to rent product to stack up um, unless you're a large institution and can fund it through. Um, because if you look at it from a um, traditional or conventional um, development finance model, because the on completion um, asset is a low yielding asset, um, the interest servicing is very challenging. So because the interest serving is challenging, you reverse engineer it and say, well, what can we finance on completion that we're comfortable, right? Which is typically sub 50% loan to value. Whereas for a, a bill to sell with adequate pre-sales, you're at 65%. And that 15% is a big difference. Because mm. on the return on equity, if you're tipping in another 15% on the end value of the product, of the, um, of the project, it's going to have a um, very much a um, uh, inimical effect on your IRR. So for private developers, it's really difficult to make stack up. For institutions with a lot of capital and a lot of lazy capital that can afford to fund it through, and debt doesn't matter, it makes sense. And that's why you're seeing operators of the ilk of Mervac um, proliferating the build to rent product in Australia. And I think those institutions will continue to play in that space. Um, and it's no doubt an emerging asset class in this country, but it's still immature. I don't think it's you know going to occupy 50% of all products you know in a decade's time, like you know some pundits are suggesting. Um, but it definitely has its place in Australia. On tax and tax reform, we've just seen, and I know you do a lot of business in New South Wales. We've just seen some proposed reforms there in terms of stamp duty and land tax. Do you have an opinion on that and, and what effect it may have down the track for yeah. your developers or developer clients? Well, I mean, stamp duty has always been the bugbear of of every developer, every private developer, particularly um, because it. They're, they're, by removing the stamp duty concession, which all states have done, um, it takes away the incentive for buyers off the plant. That's like, especially if there isn't a, um, uh, an influx of, of demand for a particular project, it begs the question, why would a buyer purchase if they don't need to and they can wait until completion? They don't have 10% sitting idly in a bank account for two years. They don't have the uncertainty as to what's going to transpire in that two-year period. You just wait till it's, the product's complete. Um, so I'm a huge advocate for um, re, um, re-establishing the, an incentive um, by, through stamp duty concessions to um, better motivate buyers uh, to, to purchase off the plan and enable more projects to be activated and more supply to come online. Um, and the knock-on effect obviously is better housing affordability, um, you know, moving forward. Um, so I think that is a very obvious um, uh, tax uh, reform uh, that all state governments should be looking at. So just on mezzanine finance, I know it's a popular topic amongst developers. Tell us about what it is and how it can assist in, in what they're doing. So mezzanine finance effectively allows developers to lever up their debt. So it's a layer of finance above and beyond the senior debt. So if you look at a capital stack, that'd be senior debt, which is first mortgage lending, which is last in and first out when um, a project completes. You'll have mezzanine or second mortgage lending, which is second in and second out when a project completes. And then you have the developer's equity. Typically senior debt in conventional terms will go to 65% of the value of the end product or 80% of the cost. Mm -hmm. Mezzanine finance will typically take you to 75% of the end value of a product or 90% of the cost and then 10% equity. So it gives you another sliver of debt that enables you to better utilise your equity and typically generate a better return on investment for the developer. Now, critically for us, the litmus test of whether a developer should be using mezzanine finance is they should, should be using it if they don't have to use it. And by, by that, I mean, it's not a substitute or a way to get a project off the ground where you don't have enough capital to fund it. 
is a means by which you can release equity that you'd otherwise have in the project to better utilise elsewhere. So there's opportunity cost your equity being tied up in a project and you can go and acquire another site um, or utilise it for another um, purpose that will generate a better return on investment than what you're paying for that mezzanine finance. Because the mezzanine finance by virtue of being higher risk than the first mortgage finance or the senior debt is at a more expensive rate. A lot of developers have always used structured finance which is what mezzanine and senior debt together is classified as. Um, and use it very effectively and it's part of their business model. A lot of developers will pick and choose which projects they'd like to use the structured finance and which projects they'd use just typical vanilla senior debt. And then there are developers that are very conservative um, and don't see the point in paying mid-teen interest rates for debt and will only use um, first mortgage um, funding. So it does depend on the risk appetite of the developer, depends on the idiosyncrasies of um, a particular project and what else the developer wants to do with their capital, um, but it definitely has a very pivotal role to play in development finance in Australia. What do you? What's your take on on when traditional banks may return to really getting into the market and providing the same level of finance that they were prior to 2020 or, or 2018 for that matter? Yeah. Well, one thing I'm certain of is the banks will never get back to the oligopolistic position they held in commercial real estate debt in this country. Prior to the GFC, uh, they were high 80s in terms of their proportion of all commercial real estate debt in this country. So 87, 88% is what they peaked at. That's now come down to closer to 70% and our house view is that will um, erode further to, to around the 50 to 60% mark, which I see as being a healthy debt market. You need the diversity, you need the non-banks to be active. You don't want this homogenous bank product or the reliance on four major lenders, particularly when they're disempowered these days by virtue of the regulator and they're not able to make their own decisions on capital deployment. Um, will the regulator potentially loosen the, um, the uh, restrictions? Uh, yes. And I think the Treasurer is a big proponent of less regulation. At the moment, it's particularly targeted on retail lending um, and home loans. But I do believe it will translate to perhaps uh, more laissez-faire regulation for um, the banks on commercial real estate debt over the next few years. And I think that will enable them to come into market and compete a little bit more actively than they have been. But no, they'll never return to that same position of preponderance and the non-bank lending um, dynamic uh, is here to stay um, and in my mind is, is a healthy and uh, necessary part of any credit market irrespective of geography. And you look at the US and European experiences where they've got much more mature and complex credit markets and non-bank lenders or institutional capital typically occupies at least 50% of all loans written in those markets. And I believe that's where we're heading and I believe that's a healthy proportion for institutional versus, versus bank capital in this country. On a global scale, how attractive do you think Australia is as a destination for investment as a result of the handling of COVID that we've seen this year mm -hmm. as compared with the UK or the US or, mm -hmm. or any other country for that matter? Do you think there will be an influx of new capital into Australia? Yeah, I think COVID's reinforced just what a safe haven Australia is. Um, you know, being obviously an island and not having porous borders um, makes it a lot easier for us to manage through a pandemic. Um, so I think if anything, it's going to hold our real estate market in, in great stead come the recovery and, you know, come the time when borders reopen and there's a um, vaccine um, and we can return to business as usual. You know, I think those particularly the key gateway city, global gateway cities in Melbourne and Sydney, which were already on a very steep upward trajectory in terms of attracting global capital prior to um, COVID, they'll come out of this only bigger and stronger. What's your thoughts on, on the market for the next 12 to 24 months? Where's it headed? I think there'd be a really strong recovery in residential values in, in Melbourne and Sydney. I don't think Sydney hasn't come off all that much, but obviously Melbourne has because it's been particularly hard hit. I think we'll see a bounce in mid 2021 and then a very strong recovery from that point forward. Um, I do have a very sanguine view of the, the real estate market in this country generally. 
Um, and, you know, I think the asset classes that I'm uncertain about, with, which is hotel and, and, and office, I'm, you know, loathe to sort of forecast where they'll head mm-hmm. over the next 12 to 24 months, only to say that occupancy rates, particularly in, in, the, in office, are going to be very slow to, um, to uh, recover and what the post-COVID normal looks like for, for large corporates particularly and how much office space they'll be looking to occupy vis-a-vis where they were pre-COVID. You know, that's the big question. Um, and there's no doubt going to be um, a shift, a cultural shift in the way um, employees uh, um, interact. Uh, and the amount of time employees spend at home versus um, in the office and how that translates to demand for, for office space is going to be fascinating to see in the, uh, in the ensuing years. Two final ones to finish. I know you're a passionate horse racing fan and advocate. Where did that passion come from? I think I read that you were watching it on television once because there was no other sport to watch and you sort of learnt about it through there. Is yeah. that true? And, and secondly, where's your passion for horse racing now? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I actually had an aversion to horse racing growing up as a kid, um, and I'd always turn the channel off when uh, the sports news turned to that topic. Um, and I just uh, started taking active interest uh, in my final year of school, uh, just as a distraction from exams, because they were around that same time as the spring carnival. And I just wanted a way to break it up, um, and it went from being sort of an, a passing interest um, to a passion to you know a, a venerable obsession now um, and you know it all comes back to that connection with the horse being around horses spending time in stables watching track work and just this majestic animal um, and the um, you know the the connection that you have with the animal that's the most important thing to be passionate about the industry if you don't have that passion for the animal then you're never going to be passionate about the industry um, and, you know, Winston Churchill said it best when he said the outside of a horse is good for the inside of a man. And there is something about being close to horses that just make you feel great. Um, but to me, the, 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 the appeal in terms of the industry goes obviously beyond just the love of the animal. And I, I love the whole analytical challenge of doing form, of, of, um, of the breeding side of things and delving deep into pedigrees and I find it quite a cerebral um, uh, outlet for me and you know like I don't want to look at racing through a commercial lens because I do that every day with my business so I, I try to avoid looking at it in terms of dollars and cents to me it's just the challenge of being successful and achieving great things in the industry and that's what drives me um, and the whole ownership piece where you can actually be part of a sport as a non-athlete, it's the only sort of mainstream sport that gives you the access to be in the huddle with the jockey and the trainer before a race um, and feel part of the sport and that you can change the course of history as an owner by making critical decisions, which I have in the past. Um, and that empowerment, I think, is what is so magnetising about horse ownership and what drives me to um, continue to be actively involved and, and seek success and bring new people and clients into the industry and see their, their joy um, at participating and winning a race for the first time. And the thrill of winning the Melbourne Cup or one of the other major Group 1 races, what's that like, if you can describe oh, It's just the most exhilarating thing you can experience. Um, and, you know, I've had, you know, professional um, footballers who have won premierships um, involved in horses and say to me that it actually was more um, electrifying winning a major race than it was being part of a premiership team. Um, Dennis Pagan, you know, is a good example. He recently said it was 10 times better winning, you know, the derby um, with Johnny B. Angry than it was, you know, winning a premiership with North Melbourne. Now, he might have been getting caught up in all the hubris of, of the aftermath of the race, but it gives you sort of some insight into just how, like, what an incredible experience it is and how much you feel part of that victory, not as a spectator, but as an integral um, protagonist in the sport. So yeah, it's, it's something that's very difficult to explain, but I'd lo- I hope everyone might get the opportunity one day to experience it. Bray, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on our program. Thanks so much for your time this afternoon.